What's up? I'm Channel Pub, the mascot for the level-headed fanboy. And today, I'm here to talk about one of my all-time favorite shows. One that remains very near and dear to my heart nearly five years after its cancellation. You read the title, you've seen the thumbnail, and you know what you're in for. I'm gonna be talking all about why Gotham still deserves to be remembered to this day. Tell me, did you subscribe? You will. And you'd better not forget to hit that like button as well. This video is not sponsored by Wayne Enterprises or LixCorp. So check out the Patreon link in the description below and consider making a monthly pledge. Men are still good. So it's been a little over four years since Gotham ended. And if that doesn't give you an existential crisis, I don't know what will. Seriously, question for the older people in the audience. Does time ever slow back down again? Or is it just like accelerating to your deathbed by the time you hit your 20s? The game has changed when it comes to superhero shows. We live in the age of the mega budget Disney Plus show, where TV shows no longer feel all that far removed from their big screen counterparts. Shows like WandaVision, Loki, the production value is just insane. You might as well be watching a very long mega budget movie all from the comfort of your own home. And it's not just Marvel that are delivering the game changing TV entertainment either. DC are also getting in on the action with big budget shows such as Peacemaker and Doom Patrol offering up much more cinematic experiences. Heck, even the CW is going a little more cinematic with Superman and Lois, which is a show I've just got to talk about. The landscape for superhero television just looks a lot different to how it did when Gotham was around, the last remaining remnant of that lower budget era of superhero TV is the CW Flash, which is ending this year, which will mark the end of the CW's flagship Arrowverse. So we've come a fairly long way since the end of Gotham, but that doesn't mean we should forget Gotham altogether. I mean, even as it is, eras come and go, but these stories are going to stick with people. In 10 years time, there's going to be people talking all about how they grew up with the Flash TV series and how it shaped them as a person, and there's something pretty beautiful about that, that very few of these mega-budget MCU shows can really match. I think that's what Gotham did for me as well, as short of a run as it got. We got to see these characters grow, change, develop over time, and I feel like I grew up with them. Particularly Bruce Wayne, who this show sees from boy to Batman, kinda. But like, with Gotham, it felt like a little niche as well, this little cult thing. Like, the CW's Arrowverse was far more mainstream, whereas this was like something I could call my my very own. And when people knew Gotham or loved Gotham, there was kind of that sense of like knowing smile that would be shared between two people who, who know the other person is a person of culture. A lot of my friendships were strengthened by discussion of this show and why it's so great. I always found the artistry behind this show and its outfits and its makeup to be oddly inspiring. I wanted a cut off face of my very own. And hey, Gotham is what got me into the world of making YouTube videos as well. With my first video ever to break over a thousand views being a video essay, <laughs> quote unquote video essay anyway, more like an eight minute letter of complaints, all about why I disagreed with the decisions they were making at the time regarding the character of the Joker. It got way over a thousand views actually. Come back guys, I'm making Gotham videos again. <laughs> so let's talk all about why Gotham is so great, talking about its strengths. Well for one, Gotham went against the grain of the time. The CW Arrowverse shows were all about appealing to young audiences with a very contemporary style. A nice, vibrant, upbeat tone. Characters that would be relatable for the young people. Teachable moments and morals. Gotham is a show that dared to be ugly. This was a show all about monsters. While it wasn't set in any specific time and did have things like modern technology in there, Gotham had very much sort of a 1970s house of horror sensibility to it. It was a show that was proud to be zany over the top and a little bit grim. And the enthusiasm that this show would exude was oddly infectious. It's, I think, why it got such a response out of the people that loved it. It was just unabashedly silly, but also sincere. I think my favorite thing about Gotham was tuning in week to week to see unique adaptations of the Batman rogues gallery. The show started off in season one with more of a mob focus, focusing on characters like Carmine Falcone, Sal Maroney, and Fish Mooney. And the show did a really great job 
job at making me invest in these characters that I otherwise was never too enthusiastic about. Typically speaking in Batman media, things like gang wars and mobs are a background element, while characters that are larger than life like Two-Face, the Joker, Riddler tend to take the center stage. In Season 1 of Gotham, the gang wars take the center stage. That's not to say though that there's any shortage of larger than life personalities, but the focus was mainly on a young Jim Gordon taking on a young Penguin who is manipulating the gangs in Gotham also that he can become the king of the crime underworld. And I'll say this, Gotham did a great job at making me interested in characters that I wasn't otherwise that interested in, like Carmine Falcone for one great example. A villain who is brutal, unkind, but also principled as well. With John Doman turning in an incredibly graceful performance as this character. Seriously, it's an incredible performance. In his first season as well, Gotham does come with kind of a villain of the week format too. You've got classic Batman villains such as Victor Zaz played by Anthony Carrigan, who was just born to play this role and is an absolute scene stealer, as well as Colm Fior playing the disturbing Dr. Dullmacher. But you also get some original villains as well, such as the Balloon man and the ogre. And I gotta say, I really like some of these ideas. I know that people really didn't like the balloon man episode, but the idea of a guy tying his victims to weather balloons and just letting them float off, that's a great idea. But the show definitely steps into its strides in the second season, where it really kind of cements that 1970s House of Horrors tone and dedicates itself more to being kind of this comic booky show rather than say like a police precinct show, which feels more like what the first season is going for. For. That doesn't mean to say count the first season out though, there's a lot of great stuff there and it does a great job at establishing characters like the Penguin, the Riddler, and their conflicts. I also just love these very unique adaptations of the Batman rogues gallery though. The Riddler is pretty much exactly as I always imagined him, however the Penguin as played by Robin Lord Taylor completely redefines this character. The core who the Penguin is is still there, but this isn't some stout little homunculus. This isn't some wealthy gremlin man, and he's not this, mm, I say, aristocratic fellow. <laughs> no, he's not the top hat and monocle clad man that he is in the comics, much more this guy trying to weasel his way up Gotham's food chain. This is a penguin with his own iconography, be it his spiky hair or his limp walk, which feels reminiscent of a penguin. And thanks to this televised format being much more long form than, say, a movie, and Penguin being a lead character in this show, I think we get to spend more time with this version of the Penguin than we do any other live action comic book villain. And so be it, because Robin Lord Taylor as the Penguin is fantastic. And it's also cool that this was our first live action Penguin since Batman 66 to be a actual just like a human rather than a sewer dwelling Penguin Man, but the show also brings us our very first live action adaptation of Hugo Strange played by B.D. Wong. And he's incredibly faithful to the source material and B.D. Wong turns in a really fun, really rather subtle performance. We also see adaptations of characters like Poison Ivy, Clayface, Mr. Freeze. If you want a live action Mr. Freeze that isn't the Arnold Schwarzenegger version, well Gotham's got you covered. You've got a Mr. Freeze here that focuses a bit more on the tragedy of the character when in his own story, however he does sadly get relegated to Mook later on. Yeah, it ain't perfect, but still, it is cool just to see a really cool live action Mr. Freeze. And his origin story in this show? handled pretty well. You've also just got characters that you'd be less likely to see in a film as well. A great example being Professor Pig, who was handled brilliantly. His arc in Gotham was so dark, so grim, so disturbing in places. If you want to see an incredibly camp version of Professor Pig singing He Had It Coming, while Gotham's rich and powerful are all gathered around a table ready to eat human pies, yeah, that's what Gotham's all about. Big thumbs up for cannibalism. We've also got characters like the Ventriloquist, the Mad Hatter, Firefly. Just the list goes on, like, you can watch this show purely just to see live action adaptations of Batman villains and you'll get that. You will get that in spades. That's, I think, reason enough to definitely revisit the show or watch it for the first time if you haven't already. Gotham also gives us the first live action version of Jim Gordon that's actually paired with his partner Harvey Bullock. Harvey Bullock had never appeared in live action before this, but here he gets a major role as the morally gray, rough around the edges partner to Jim Gordon, who we gradually see become a better person as the series goes on. It's kind of a good cop, bad cop 
top duo here. Jim Gordon is obviously incredibly idealistic, which proves nigh on impossible to work with, as Gotham is just a particularly cursed city in this show. And it's cool to just see that paired up with a character like Harvey Bullock. I'm surprised we haven't seen more of this dynamic since. Kind of hoping that we see Harvey Bullock in a future Matt Reeves Batman film. There's a great sense of crossover with the villains as well, particularly with the Penguin and Riddler. We see these two kind of living their lives and how they start to kind of converge and cross paths in season one, going on to become like best friends to sort of kind of a love interest kind of thing in season three. It's kind of ballsy that they took the Penguin and they made him not straight, as he falls in love with the Riddler who does not reciprocate. It's no surprise that Gotham had the shipping community that it did. But just how these two villains play off of each other, how they constantly seem to want to kill each other, but they're also like deep down they are the best of friends. There's a genuine love between these two, even if they are willing to betray that at any moment. Also Riddler, Go gotta talk about Riddler real quick. It's like Riddler just leapt off of the pages and into the show. Corey Michael Smith is everything I dreamed the Riddler would be. He even gets the green suit and bowler hat combo. And yes, fully expectedly, he rocks it. We've also got the young Bruce Wayne and Alfred. Because yes, this is still an origin story for Batman. And we get to see the formative years of Bruce Wayne between the death of his parents to him going off to train in the Himalayas. But this young Bruce Wayne is still treated with a lot of dignity and respect, as though he is an adult Bruce Wayne. Because yes, I mean, like losing your parents at that age is going to sober you up. Up. It is going to mature you going forward. But we do kind of see the bumps in that road, especially as like in early season four, Bruce starts to really mistreat Alfred. Still, there's a great dynamic between Bruce and Selina Kyle, and there's kind of, you know, a, a, a love between the two. There's a bond there. As kind of hot and cold as Selina Kyle can be with him, and she has her own struggles, of course, the relationship between those two is absolutely believable. But then we come to the absolute best version of Alfred, in my opinion. And look, I don't think there's ever been a bad Alfred in life action. I mean, I didn't like the one in Joker, but I don't think you were supposed to like the one in Joker. But like, Sean Pertwee stands out to me as my all-time favorite Alfred. This is a guy who's not afraid to get his hands dirty, but I also just believed his sort of fatherly dynamic with Bruce more than any other. It's probably partly thanks to the fact that we get to spend the most time with these two out of any Bruce and Alfred duo. But this Alfred is freaking father of the year. Sean Pertwee's Alfred is an absolute legend. He is the coolest guy ever. He's my favorite protagonist in this show. They do more kind of the modern Alfred thing here. He's less the doting butler and more sort of like a former SAS agent, more of a bodyguard to the Waynes. He speaks with lesser prim and proper kind of debonair to him. He's far more cockney and very quotable, might I add. But his devotion to Bruce Wayne is so commendable and it's really at the forefront of this version of the character. He's willing to break rules. He's willing to fight for Bruce and that really comes across this time. But also just that Alfred is one of the people that teaches Bruce how to fight. This version of Alfred is badass. Gotham also gives us, in my opinion, the best live action version of the Joker ever, in the form of Jerome Valeska. Of all of the Jokers in live action, Jerome feels the most like the Mark Hamill Joker from Batman the Animated Series and the Batman Arkham series stepped into live action. Everything that made Mark Hamill's depiction of the Joker so great is present here. That sick, twisted, yet oddly infected sense of humor. He's incredibly charismatic. There's this tremendous sense of deliberately over-the-top showmanship when it comes to Jerome Valeska. You can tell that he's absolutely loving and relishing in every moment of the sheer psychosis he exudes. Cameron Monaghan's performance as this version of the Joker is so utterly captivating that it is physically impossible to be distracted by anything else while he's on screen. All the while Jerome is on screen, you will not be checking your phone. You will not be doing anything with your thumbs. You will just be watching because that performance is so good. And he's playing such a classic version of this character. Again, it feels like the Joker from Batman the Animated Series wiped off the face paint and stepped into live action. And that, that's the crazy part about this is no, he doesn't have the face paint. Yet he still looks like the Joker. In like early season one and two, just the guy just looks like the Joker. He of course does get a cut off face look akin
into the new 52 Joker, which is really cool because like they've taken all of the elements that were new to the new 52 style of Joker and apply them to Jerome, but without bringing in like the makeup and the green hair and purple suit. The cut off face kind of speaks for itself, but it also creates that Joker grin as his face is stretched across. This is just a version that captures that sort of animated musicality of the Joker in a way that I just haven't seen a live action depiction do before. And partly because they're not really aiming for that. I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, Heath Ledger failed to live up to this. No, he's going in a different direction. But just to see this version of the Joker done this way just feels cathartic to me as a longtime Joker fan. Now, the thing is... Warner Brothers did not allow them to actually use the Joker in this show. This is effectively an unauthorized adaptation of the character, but it also just makes it all the more interesting in how they find ways to work around that, treating Jerome as though he's this completely original character who's kind of just coincidentally like the Joker, even though they totally know what they're doing. Also, seeing the Joker's iconic laughing gas make it to live action, Awesome. Oh my god. This show doesn't just feel like Batman without Batman. It feels kind of more like what if the Batman rogues gallery all rose to power, but Batman was just a mere child who couldn't really do much about it. It allows these villains a chance to take the spotlight and really justifies the existence of a Batman. You do kind of lose that whole philosophy of Batman's presence causes these villains to step up because these guys are a ridiculously eccentric bunch prior to the Batman coming to the scene. But it's just a show that shows no restraint in what Batman stories it adapts all the while not having a Batman. So kind of you get that secondary appeal of what if this story didn't actually have Batman in it? What if Batman was still a child unequipped to deal with this? It it makes it an interesting show in its very own right. This sort of Elseworlds thing, and I think that's exactly how Gotham should be approached as well. It's an Elseworlds show. Because, yeah, there's going to be lots of questions like, you know, why is the Joker obsessed with Bruce Wayne more so than the Batman? Why are so many of his enemies so much older than he is? And, of course, yes, the idea that the presence of Batman caused the criminal underworld in Gotham to step up and reflect him. This show has a very different appeal from that. This show basically presents it as, no, the villains came first and Batman man is the answer to them rather than the other way around. Which in my opinion doesn't defeat the object, it just kind of twists it on its head rather. Which is everything a good Elseworlds story does. This show is also extremely violent, but in a very fun way. When there's not a gunfight, there's people being cooked into pies. When there's not that, there's eyes being gouged out, or people being eaten, or Jerome Valeska's face getting cut off. It's a very bloody, very violent show. And you know what I say to that? Yay violence, give me more violence, I love violence. It's done in a way that elicits those kinds of reactions out of me. Again, very House of Horrorsy. The Dollmaker storyline is just pure body horror. When you see all the different stitched up parts of different people all attached together, ugh, very frightening indeed. Also, it just needs to be said, the acting pedigree on display here is just top tier. Like, this is still some of the best acting in any comic book show. Like, this show saw Duvid Mazus grow up from child actor to sort of a young adult, kind of an adolescent, I guess. But like, even when he was a kid, he did a really good job as an actor, which is crazy because kid actors are actually pretty difficult to come by. But from the get-go, he sold me as a young Bruce Wayne, and yeah, like later on, he sold me as a young adult Bruce Wayne. He understands the gravitas required for this character. Even though he's just a kid, you can take him seriously. The same goes for Cameron Bikendova as Selena Kyle, who honestly resembles like a kid version of Michelle Pfeiffer, so that's pretty cool. Once again, though, she might have been a child actress at the time, but she still turns in a performance that you can absolutely take seriously. She definitely sells the role of this broken kid. And the dichotomy she has with Bruce Wayne, Bruce being the idealist, her being much more of a realist, because she's grown up on the streets, no silver spoon in her mouth. Ben McKenzie and Donald Logue are fantastic in the duo of Jim Gordon and Harvey Bullock. Robin Lord Taylor and Corey Michael Smith as Penguin and Riddler, respectively. Got nothing but good things to say about those two. And Robin Lord Taylor, he just plays this role like he's a little good-for-nothing snitch. It's brilliant. As mentioned before, Sean Pertwee as Alfred is just absolutely fantastic. Cameron Monaghan, captivating as the Joker. John Doman as Carmine Falcone, 
excellent. Anthony Carrigan as Victor Zaz, total scene stealer. BD Wong as Hugo Strange, chilling. Marina Bakarin as the love interest, Leslie Tompkins, has phenomenal chemistry with Ben McKenzie, and go figure, the two I believe are married in real life. And as a much more level-headed character, she never feels drowned out by the larger-than-life performances that are in this show. We've also got to talk a little bit about Erin Richards as Barbara Keane, former girlfriend to Jim Gordon, turned villain, who kind of serves as like a bit of a Harley Quinn analog, but she also has ties to the League of Shadows, and Erin Richards plays her very well. She has that very Harley Quinn-esque energy, but knows when to rein it in and dial it back, because this is still a very original character. So look, with all that being said, Gotham, yes, it's a great show, but it's not without its weaknesses as well, of course. Like, we gotta still be honest when, you know, reminiscing to how great this show was. Yeah, we had a very weak adaptation of The Court of Owls in Season 3. That It was a oddly unengaging arc. I found it to be very dull, which is crazy because Gotham on a whole is anything but dull, but it does seem that The Court of Owls just didn't really fit Gotham, and I think it's a story you need to tell with Batman as well as the Batman family as well. I think you need those components to really do that story justice, and I think that's why it suffered here. As well as that, while I've said that this show does have the best live-action adaptation of the Joker, the Joker's origin story is incredibly frustrating in this show. As they treat the Joker like he's this Russian doll, they just pop one out of the next out of the next. Oh, we killed off Jerome. Well, pop out a Jeremiah Valeska in that case. Not only does it feel pointless, but also, like, Jerome was the best one. I like Jeremiah a lot. I really, really do, but I just, I can't help but feel he's a downgrade when we got it so right the first time. It's like, oh, here's the Joker you've always wanted, the Joker you've always dreamt of seeing on the big screen. Here he is. And now it's time for something completely different. Wait, no, no, give us back what we had before. That was, that was better. I like that a lot. God damn it. It needs to be acknowledged that the final season of Gotham was probably the weakest one. I still enjoyed it more than most of the second half of season three, which was the Court of Owls and Tetch virus arc, which just went on way too long. But that final season, it had a lot to kind of juggle, a lot to kind of take on in a very short space of time. And they had so much filler for no reason. It was like, oh yeah, we got to wrap these characters up. So here's some new characters. It's like, no, 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 I don't care about Bane. I don't care about the ventriloquist right now. I, I want to see where's the penguin and the Riddler going. Ugh, Bane. What was the point of any of that? It's no secret that the finale here was not up to snuff either, feeling a bit like a very low-budget fan film, and I, I don't mean that as an insult to low-budget fan films, I just, I would expect much more from this, from a budgeted project, because this is put to shame by some actual low-budget fan films. It's a finale that feels like it was made on a budget of three quid and a packet of crisps, and that packet of crisps was sold so they could get the money to make the worst bat suit ever. A terrible last impression to end the show on. I think this finale here is probably why Gotham isn't remembered more fondly than it is. This show was a powerhouse up until that final season. We also have things like introductions of characters like Crispus Allen and Harvey Dent who just go nowhere. They, they, they just disappear off the face of the earth. It's not ideal. It's a show that definitely had a little bit of trouble juggling all the things it was trying to do, but that said, the things it finished, the things it did well, it did really well, and it was just a consistently entertaining show. Gotham is not perfect, but it's a show that has excellent performances, outstanding production designs, and some stories that will stay with you. I think a personal favorite episode of mine is This Ball of Mud and Meanness, where Bruce Wayne finally meets the killer of his parents, Matches Malone, and he realizes is that this person that's been a specter in his life, this person he thought was a monster, is just a man. We see his journey to getting to that point, and it's just, it's a great story. And I think that's the main thing with Gotham, is it's just a cathartic, satisfying show. And I think it just really deserves to be remembered. Not just for that, but also it's very unique Batman rogues gallery adaptations, and just being a really good Batman Elseworld story. It's a show that means a lot to me. It's probably still my favorite comic book TV show, even though there are shows that I would say are better quality such as Peacemaker. But put it this way, I still prefer Gotham to every MCU show I've seen. And I don't even have an anti-MCU bias. I love the MCU, but I just, I don't think their comic book shows 
live up to Gotham in terms of just knowing what they want to be, you know? Gotham was such a genre outlier that it's like, it's just something special because of that. Now, I'm going to be real. The sad, hard to swallow pill is there will never be a season six of Gotham. It's never going to happen. Season five was the ending. Even if there's like a big boom in interest or someone's interested in financing it, the show ends with Batman. That's how it was always promised to be. And anything after that is just going to be a Batman show. And if they decided to flash back to stuff that maybe happened before that time, what can you really justify showing at this point? We know how this ends now. And like, yeah, obviously we knew Batman was going to become Batman, but like <laughs> what I mean by that is we know the payoff that these characters get. We know what becomes of them in the beginnings of Batman. These specific versions have had their stories told. So I don't think a continuation in the form of a Gotham season six would ever work. What would be cool in my opinion would be if we got a comic book continuation, akin to like what we have with the Batman 89 and Batman 66 comics. DC Comics have shown that they're willing to revisit bygone eras of their characters. And it would be sweet to have a Batman comic series set in the Gotham universe. See this Batman refining his craft, fighting against the Robin Lord Taylor Penguin, the Corey Michael Smith version of the Riddler, the thin-haired, cryptkeeper looking Joker. I think a lot of these designs would translate back into comics very well. And you know what, even if they never do it in an official capacity, I would love to see a fan-made Gotham continuation comic. Another awesome thing though would be if they could get the Gotham cast back together to do a DC animated movie, kind of like a straight to Blu-ray, straight to streaming thing. That's just a Batman movie set in the Gotham universe. Heck, even out of continuity, I'd just be open to seeing these actors take on these roles again. And just, I need to see Cameron Monaghan play a Joker that's actually allowed to call himself the Joker. I need it. There's no better role for him. And there's no better actor for this role. Just, I need it. Wally West can bite it. I want to see Cameron Monaghan as the Joker. Maybe, maybe James Gunn? Maybe, maybe he can make this happen? In some ways, Gotham maybe does live on. Tying in with the Matt Reeves Batman movies, we are getting a Penguin TV series. And I mean, let's be real, like, Gotham was effectively a Penguin TV series. But we're also set to get shows about the GCPD and Arkham Asylum as well, so there's not going to be any shortage of Batman on the TV, and the Matt Reeves Batman universe doesn't feel too far of a cry from Gotham. Either way, I'm looking forward to this next generation of televised Batman shows without any Batman in them. Whether it continues or not though, Gotham still deserves to be remembered and celebrated for the great show that it was. And that's all from me for today. What do you guys think? Do you still love Gotham to this day? Comment below, discuss, and as always, if you enjoyed this video and you want to see more like it, be sure to hit subscribe, hit the like button, and in the description below is a link to the Patreon, where for just $1 a month, you can get your name in the credits of my videos. And now it's time for a very special, literal shout out to the patrons in the $10 or above tier. Their names are as follows. Kale Bennett! That Jordo! King K! Legendary Ray Ray! Dr. SP here with your PSA for the day! Yes, I'm a real doctor! You can't prove anything! Sergio! Cirrus the Skeptic! And I love the Boss Baby movies! I'm the biggest fan! And then in the $5 or above tier, we've got Broski, SSS06, Dazzle Fizzle, and Council of Geeks. Thank you so much to all of you for your generosity. And as for the rest of you, Thank you so much for watching, and have a great day.